Today's episode of the Fine Home Building Podcast is brought to you by Rockwool. Life is loud. From noisy kids to blaring electronics, it's a big challenge. Cut the noise with Rockwool Safe and Sound Stone Wool Insulation. Made from rock, it naturally blocks sound. So no matter what video game the kids are playing, the rest of the family can enjoy a quieter, more comfortable space. To learn more about Rockwool Safe and Sound Stone Wool Insulation, visit rockwool.com. Also brought to you by Build Direct. Looking for quality flooring materials at wholesale prices, but also want to cut out that time-consuming looking part? Stop driving from store to store searching for a product that might not even be in stock. Let Build Direct Pro do it for you, for free. As a Build Direct Pro, you'll be connected with a personal account rep that sources your products to spec at the lowest tiered price and manages the logistics and delivery of your order directly to your job site. Plus, you get added perks like unlimited free samples delivered overnight and up to $5,000 credit on product purchases throughout the year. Join for free at builddirect.com slash bdpros. Also brought to you by Wasco. Wasco Windows produces beautiful, multifunctional European-style windows and doors right in their own Milwaukee factory, using the best components from Germany and the United States. These windows and doors offer superior thermal, air infiltration, and structural performance, making them the best choice for passive, net zero, or other high-energy performance buildings. Wasco's European windows are available as single tilt-and-turn windows, as well as in a variety of multi-pane designs. Visit www.wascowindows.com and find out why, if you have Wasco windows, you know the Wasco difference. I mean, I've seen, you know, that they're basically two stories tall, leaning up against a house uh, when they're framing up some of these, uh, these stick-built roofs. And, uh, you know, I got to imagine that I'd have to have that thing delivered by like a pair of Chinooks or something like that to get my lumber <laughs> dropped onto the site. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. I am your host, Justin Fink. If you're new to the show, welcome. If you're old to the show, welcome back. Uh, you guys know what we do here. We talk about all things building and remodeling. And uh, today we have two special guests from LP. Why don't you guys introduce yourselves? So, hi, I'm Brian St. Germain. I'm the uh, Director of Quality and Technology for the Engineered Wood Group. All right. Yeah, and I'm uh, Scott Lockyer. I'm the National Sales Manager for our Specified Markets, so dealing a lot with uh, multifamily construction, but also know the single-family market pretty well. All right. Well, one half of that was going to be an indication of what we're talking about today, and that's engineered lumber. So uh, I, I mentioned this on a show a while back, and we had a little bit of a delay in getting the interview set up. So for all of you who are waiting for this, now is the time. We're going to talk about engineered wood. And I just wanted to start, well, why don't we start with, like, who is LP? Because a lot of people might not even know um, about the company. So, uh, you know, who can give kind of a quick summary of what you guys do? Yeah, LP brought uh, building products. Um, we began in the early 1970s, really, you know, one of the, uh, you know, the first people that really commercialized oriented strand boards. So, you know, the common product that you're going to see in your, your flooring and wall applications. Um, since that time, we've evolved into, uh, you know, making other products uh, like a cement coated OSB. We also have our smart side products. So really, you know, what we do is really look at how we can uh, leverage that uh, basic OSB technology and turn it into all sorts of other products. Also uh, engineered wood like LSL, uh, LVL, and iJoyce. Now, um, when you guys say that you were the first ones to, did you say one of the first ones or the first one to commercialize yeah. OSB? The first first company to commercialize OSB. Now, is that or when you say that, are we talking what everyone back then would refer to as flake board, or is the true OSB? Yeah, there were generations prior to OSB that would be uh, wafer board was kind of the common term used. Yeah, um, or or any strand board really uh, came into play when it started replacing plywood um, and doing everything that plywood can do in the market. So now, can you tell me the difference between wafer board and OSB, or actually tell the audience? Uh, yeah, so uh, oriented strand board utilizes, uh, you know, a strand that actually has geometry to it. So it's got a very uh, specific width and a specific length. 
And what that does is it allows us to orient those strands in the mat prior to pressing, hence the term oriented strand board. Uh, wafer board, the, the predecessor to OSB, uh, simply used flakes material that didn't have a geometry and therefore you weren't able to align them um, in the structure of the mat. Okay. And so similar to plywood where you have cross-directional layers of veneer, OSB has cross-directional layers of strands. Um, so now for the builders that are old enough to remember this kind of, uh, the, the, the switch in technology, you know, I mean, plywood was pretty dominant. Um, and then, you know, the wafer board came on the market and, um, the downsides to it, it was before my time, but the downsides, as I've heard from people are, you know, swelling and, and brittleness and failure. I mean, is that basically what you guys were, were up against as well? Yeah, that, that's, uh, probably some of the earlier hurdles. I think yeah. those have um, long been resolved. Um, you know, the types of binders that we use today are, they're all thermally set. Um, you know, we, we have the capabilities to make very high performing products, um, again, by using polyurethane adhesives, uh, as well as uh, the level of adhesives that we put in the board, give us varying degrees of performance. Yes. And, and that's why I wanted to bring it up was that we are still sometimes battling against builders who are saying, I don't, I don't prefer to use that, that wafer board or that flake board stuff. I use plywood. And, and I always have to stop and say, well, the product that you're referring to as a problem, we're talking like 30 plus years ago at this point, you know, 30, 40 plus years ago, you know, it's, it's, you can't, it's not even the same comparison anymore. You can't even, even the worst one on the market is better than where we started. Right. Right. And if you look at, um, again, back on some of our premium products, um, our new legacy brand, uh, we have a no sand guarantee that we use. It's covered till it's covered, essentially saying that the product will not swell uh, due to moisture absorption throughout the entire bill up until the time that you put your finished flooring on. So okay. basically it covers you throughout the entire build cycle. Yeah. And, and as an example, another example of that one, one of my friends uh, who's a consulting engineer and he's very concerned about swelling uh, of your of your floor sheathing. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing he will specify is an enhanced OSB product. So he's not looking for plywood on his projects. He's looking for a product like Legacy. Right. And and you guys might have said this, but you got you don't you do not have a plywood product, right? It's just OSB. Primarily OSB. We've got one mill that makes a, a small amount of plywood, but okay. it's also a, a laminated veneer lumber mill. Oh, okay. Oh, right, because LVLs are essentially They're veneer plywood. Based. Yeah. Right. Um, okay, so uh, so talk to me about you know what. I mean, can you talk to me about what makes your kind of premium uh, OSB sheathing so durable? I mean, I know it's a it's a competitive market right now, and and you know. Obviously, you guys know who the players are, and I think our, our listeners do as well. Um, sort of, how do you how do you set yourself apart when everybody is is making a product they claim is going to be able to withstand the weather? Well, with Legacy, the the primary difference is you know, we brand it as having Gorilla Glue technology. Um, Gorilla Glue, of course, is commonly known um, in mm -hmm. the market, and it's a polyurethane adhesive. And what that does is it uh, creates both physical bonds, so that's the adhesive kind of penetrating into the wood fiber, but it also creates chemical bonds where it actually bonds chemically to the wood structure itself. Mm -hmm. uh, so we use high levels of polyurethane adhesives um, in those types of products, which makes, makes it very uh, weather tolerant. Now, is there, uh, is there sort of like a waxy surface on some of those sheathing products or no? There is, yes. We actually add wax. Um, it's integrated throughout the uh, manufacturing process, so it's coating all the strands. Mm -hmm. um, so that is that is a difference between OSB and plywood. Is plywood, you typically don't have any wax that's incorporated uh, to those materials. Okay. So Ours we do, which does make it very water repellent. So I have a question about that, just from a curiosity manufacturing standpoint. How do you coat something in wax and then glue those pieces together? Uh, they, uh, you know, there's a limit, of course, if you put <laughs> excessive amounts of wax on. Uh, the wax is very efficient, uh, so it, it doesn't interfere with the, the bonding um, of our pieces. Um, and I'm, I'm guessing that is the same reason why you can use subfloor adhesive to adhere these to your joists. Correct. 
Okay. Right. Now, is the same thing true for the top of the floor? Can I put tile thin set right over these panel products with the wax coating, or do I need to add something else that doesn't have any waxy resistance? No, uh, we don't have any compatibility issues with OSB. Oh, really? Uh, around any of those types of thin set mortars or adhesives that you might that might go on top of it. And that's not true across the industry, right? I'm not. I'm not aware of any uh, subfloor products that have compatibility issues. Mm. At least that they that they publicize. Uh, mm. I mean, it is one when you go to a, a premium OSB product. I mean, you do get some additional benefits when you don't have the thickness and swell. I mean, that could be a condition where when you're doing a thin set, depending on the type of surface you have, you know, a telegraphing or something like that. Okay. I th I swear there was one brand that I'm thinking of that you you can't adhere tile right to the surface without doing an additional layer. I'll have to check into that. We don't have to talk about that right now. Yeah. Um, so, but, okay, so we, we know where we started. We started with OSB, flake board, sheet, sheet goods, essentially. Um, and from there, what was the leap to go from those flat, thin sheets to structural, you know, uh, posts and studs and, uh, you know, load-carrying beams and that kind of a thing? Is, is it the same technology, just thicker, or did we have to rethink it? It's a similar technology, um, but of course you're you're going after different material properties. And so, if you're making uh, LVL and LSL beams and headers, um, instead of you know trying to create a, a large sheet that spans kind of multiple framing members, you've got you are the framing member. Um, so the strands that we make, they're going to be thicker, they're going to be longer. Um, they are usually applied where all the strands are oriented in the same direction, so in the length of the material, mm -hmm. uh, to create that optimal uh, strength and stiffness. Okay. And you mentioned a couple of different kinds there. So we have uh, LSL, which is which is probably most closely related to OSB, right? I mean, it's laminated right. strands. Um, laminated strand lumber, correct. Uh, LVL would be laminated veneer lumber, and that's the one that we think looks a little more like plywood. Um, yeah. And um, do you also do a PSL? Uh, we don't. LP doesn't, know. Okay. And for anybody who's, who's listening, that parallel strand lumber is a little, a little different, but sort of in the same category of engineered lumber. Um, it, did you guys make a decision not to do it for some reason, or, or is it just focusing your efforts on other things? Um, I think, you know, the products that we have accomplish uh, the same thing in the market and yeah. gives us a little more uh, flexibility in terms of manufacturing. Yeah, gotcha. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to mention about OSB that I think a lot of people don't realize is um, is sort of born from a limitation of plywood. Um, and part of the reason why we got to the world of OSB, I think, is that plywood has a limitation in the length of the panel you can create. Isn't that right? Like, you know, you never see, you never see a structural insulated panel, a big roof panel or wall panel made out of plywood, um, because it, you simply can't make plywood sheets that long. Is that correct, or am I misunderstanding? It would be more challenging. Yeah. Um, I would say the the biggest reason for the switch between plywood and, and OSB is if you look at plywood, and anytime you uh, you know take a log and you spin it, yeah. um, you have veneer grade logs, which are essentially the the premier log in the market. Uh, so you're starting with a very high quality log that you're then, you know, turning down and then making products like plywood and LBO. Um, in contrast, that OSB um, started off using, um, back in the day, it was almost considered a, a substandard species or a, right. a trash type species. Um, and we're able to take these, you know, fast growing uh, wood species like aspen, southern yellow pine, um, and then turn them into much larger uh, building elements, um, which replace a lot of their solid wood, you know, components that are already that were already in the market. Okay, so you mentioned kind of the trash species. Uh, what what kinds of wood are in OSB now, or your OSB? I guess I, sh I should ask. Right. So it depends on region. So if it's a northern region, it's primarily going to be aspen. Okay. Um, if it's a southern mill or a southern region, it's primarily southern yellow pine. Those are the, the two common that you see in the marketplace. So there today. there will be a difference regionally, but that that difference does not have does it have any working differences. You know, am I going to have to understand anything different in terms of installing one in one part of the country or the other? 
Uh, no, not really. The, the products still uh, comply with the same standards. Uh, it's the same performance category, so everything is going to be plug and play in that regard. Okay. Inherently, there's subtle differences between the two materials, um, but they're not something that the average user would, would tune into. Well, can you tell me what they are? <laughs> <laughs> uh, sure. So the uh, um, Southern Yellow Pine, it's, uh, it, uh, inherently the, the wood species itself um, has a slightly higher linear expansion. So when it does acquire moisture, it's going to um, uh, grow and lengthen with um, slightly more than aspen. Uh, so that's something during installation of the, the product, you need to make sure you provide the eighth inch gap um, mm-hmm. on all four sides. Um, but but again, these issues aren't uh, don't turn into issues on the job site, providing everything's installed correctly. Right. It, yeah. And you might also see a slight difference in your specific gravity on the materials. Um, just like if, you know, it's just the natural characteristics of the wood. I doubt I would see a difference in specific gravity, but I appreciate you, uh, giving me that vote of confidence. Uh, I'll have to do, how would I even tell that? I'd have to float it in like a bucket of water or something, wouldn't I? Yeah. Yeah. To to that point, the, uh, the pine will be uh, slightly heavier as an aspen board of the same. Right. Um, again, due to the inherently denser nature of southern yellow pine compared to aspen. Now, can you do one thing you can get get in, in – I don't mean to hang on plywood here, but I'm, I'm just thinking about it now. You can get pressure-treated plywood. Can I get pressure-treated OSB or pressure-treated OSB beams? I know a lot of people are switching to those thicker beams when building uh, exterior decks. No, um, not a pressure treatment okay. um, like plywood. Uh, most of the pressure treated plywood that you do see, it does it is um, damaging to the material, um, and you can see the impacts of that um, compared to non pressure treated plywood. Uh, what we'll do, like on our smart side product, um, is we integrate a preservative treatment into the manufacturing process, so it's pressed into the board and it's always there. Um, so it's not something that we have to pressure treat later. Right. So so your siding. You, you mentioned your siding as an example of that? Yeah. Okay. So, in other words, it doesn't have to be green for it to be weatherproof. Exactly. Right. And right. I, and, like I, our and, siding, I mean, and I mean the color green, not... <laughs> right. Right. Like, our siding uses a, a very weather durable uh, overlay, and then it's treated with a, a chemical that resists um, termite and fungal decay. Yeah, I got to say that of all of the products... I'm curious to hear your experiences if you guys ever do trade shows or, or interact with uh, the people who, who are installing your, your LP siding. Um, I don't know if I've ever seen a product that intuitively struck me as more of a failure waiting to happen that ended up being a holy crap, this stuff is incredible moment as, as your siding. I mean, you look at it and you go, that's never going to work. It looks, it looks like something you buy off the, you know, the, the cheap shelf at the, at the store and it has converted so many builders I know into believers, which I just think is so cool. So how, what did you guys figure out that nobody else has managed to figure out in, in this terms of the siding you have? Yeah, well, I know that for myself, I mean, and I've used the, uh, the LP smart side product uh, on a project of mine. And so for one, you know, if you want to go and lift up a four by eight sheet uh, of the product, it's about 40% less in weight. So just imagine that guy out there who's you know, picking up four by eight sheets all day, you know, being able to, to have that reduced weight is, is ideal. Um, as the building construction industry continues to move forward, um, some of the nice things, um, like with our product, uh, you know, we can just use a normal saw for cutting. There's no need for wet saws and mm-hmm. uh, things like that. Uh, because of the nature of it, it it's very strong. We can uh, make 16 foot links and you don't have to worry about it breaking if you're throwing it over your shoulder. So right. just all these advantages that just puts a smile on a framer's face. And I'm guessing that, you know, how does it compare from a price point, though? I mean, I mean, obviously, you're comparing it in your examples to fiber cement. And we know there are other options. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, fly ash, poly ash products. That's going to be it. That's going to be, as far as I know, the high end of that kind of, um, let's say, uh, weatherproof impervious you know siding materials um i'm guessing you guys are cheaper than that less expensive than that um but more than fiber cement somewhere in that range um the you know the last time i went to one of the you know the big box stores so you know for the homeowners out there who were you know looking to go uh, you know walk down the aisle if you will um you know our product was was less expensive than the alternatives out there really i mean it's close but but it was less wow okay um, and that's, and 
and when I use that as a sheet good, you know, like a, like a lot of people that have listened to our show writing questions about um, panel siding. So T111 yeah. is a common name. Um, I can achieve shear using that product, so I can fasten it, and that can replace my, my structural sheathing. That's correct. Yeah, you can go direct to studs with our panel siding. Actually, you can go direct to studs with our lap siding um, in certain applications, um, and that, that meets all your shear requirements of that wall. Yeah, and with the with the panel, it is an APA rated structural panel. So yeah, you can resist your your uh, wind forces, your seismic forces, all those types of things. Now with the lap, um, yeah, it's a little different scenario just because of the small pieces. Okay, all right. And um, do I have to treat any of those cut edges, or is it is it just sort of you know treated like wood, where if I make a cut, I have to then prime it? Yeah, you would want to prime the edges after you cut them. Okay. Um, and I have never actually installed it myself. Well, maybe I did. I might've put it on a shed one time, but I don't recall. I, I assume that it's just coming primed, right? Or can you, is it available as factory finished also? Yeah. So it, uh, it does come primed typically from LP, but, uh, we do work with a number of pre-finishers out there. So one of the nice things is if there is a certain color palette you're looking for, um, I know we work with, uh, you know, homeowners, uh, builders, et cetera, to, to give them those options. Um, and I don't want to put you guys in the spot because I don't know if you know the answer to this. We had a lot of trouble on a recent show. Somebody wrote into us and wanted to know the proper way to flash a window using panel siding. So let's picture, you know, if we picture a window right in the center of a four by eight sheet of ply or of, of the, uh, the smart side, how, what is the sequence? Like, does it... <laughs> you know where does the is the flashing get attached if you're if you're going to if this is your sheathing you know you don't have plywood or, or osb behind it how do you flash that window do you guys know that is that your area of expertise or no well typically you would um i guess the best way to think of it is think of the panel siding as if it were lap siding uh going up you're obviously going to have a rough end for that window opening so you are going to have some framing around it and so you would flash the window as you normally would do, and then the siding would come on, you know, last. So you would and, and cover over the flashing. So if I didn't have any sheathing, any structural sheathing behind the panel siding, I would just flash it right to the to the framing. To the framing, yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, we had we had an epic argument about this. <laughs> I'll have, to, we'll have, to, <laughs> yeah. we'll have to dig that one back up so people can relive yeah. the. Uh, the 45 minutes we spent on that topic. Um, and, and and I will say that, you know, the more common application is to use uh, the smart side over an OSB substrate. Okay. Um, and in that case, then you would, uh, you would have house wrap or something else behind. Yeah. Okay. Um, d is there any allowance on the backside of your panel for, you know, uh, back draining or do you recommend putting it over furring strips? Can you put it over furring strips if you want to, or is that not allowed? Yeah, so um, actually one of the uh, advantages of our product with the zinc borates and the waxes that we put in it, it's actually going to be uh, less absorbent than some of the other products out there. And so, for example, so first of all, yes, you can put it over furring strips to, to answer that question. Um, but also, you know, with our product under our warranty, um, you know, we'll allow you to put it uh, directly to the, to the wall without furring strips. And I know in multifamily applications uh, for fiber cement, quite often you're required to do furring strips. Okay. And can I, go, how close to grade can I go or close to a, uh, you know, an adjoining roof? Yeah. Six, six inches is our requirement. Okay. So off, of, off the ground basically. So pretty standard. Um, right. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, can you guys tell me this, you, you have a special, and I think we had you as a recent sponsor on the show, LP sheds. So what, what is the story that I've never seen a company that focused completely on a shed line of projects, products, sorry. Um, well, yeah, and it, it's one of those things where, you know, you may not, uh, you know, think about sheds as a, as a market, you know, right out of the gate, but to your point about the, you know, being able to go directly to stud with the product, I mean, that's where you can really start to see some advantages in a shed. So you've got this structural shell, it's got the aesthetic beauty with the natural wood look, um, and there's a lot of sheds being um, put onto the marketplace today. What is the? Uh, I'm, I'm just looking at the web page right now. Um, what? What you? So you have like a sheathing panel for the floor that has an overlay on it. What is that? Is that like a phenolic plywood kind of a thing? 
I mean, exactly. It's a phenolic saturated overlay paper. It's uh, very similar to the, the overlay that you would see on the exterior panel. Okay. Of course, it's smooth, so it doesn't have the uh, the wood grain embossing like we'd have on our siding product. <laughs> Let's hear about all the things that you can't tell me about that you have in the works. What what uh what are what are what are people going to see in the next coming years? Any uh, any hints that you can give us? Well, you know, I mean, you know, for myself, uh, I joined the the LP Building Products team in August of 2017, and one of the the key reasons why I joined. LP is that they're really on the forefront of new product innovation, and we've got a lot of a lot of exciting things coming down the pipeline. But uh, you know, I would say uh, you know, stop by the uh, the IBS booth in January. Oh man! All right. Well, we're gonna we'll definitely swing by, and we will find out the answer to that. But can I, if you guys have a few more minutes, I would love to find out from you uh, a little bit about engineered lumber specifically. So we cover cheat goods, and that's great. I'm really curious about this transition that we're seeing more and more of from dimensional lumber to engineered. And, you know, what are your predictions? You know, are we going to, are we going to go all the way? Uh, we'd like to see it. And you're oh, seeing uh, that in, in small we pockets. Know that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think the, uh, the same advantages, you know, in terms of LSL um, entering into the, the beam and header space, um, it provides you a very dimensionally stable, very precise building component. Um, that replaces, you know, in a lot of cases, solid wood, which of course isn't going to be as precise, isn't going to be as dimensionally stable. And so if you transition that into, um, say the, the studs and the framing members, uh, there again, you've got every piece is exactly the same. Um, you've got a material that's going to be, um, very dimensionally stable throughout the seasons. And what that leads to is of course, flat walls, um, resistant to screw pops um, in your drywall, resistance to cracking in your drywall joints and your tape seams because you just have a very dimensionally stable wall system. Okay, so let me ask you a, a couple of questions. One, um, let's let's take your, uh, let's just take a stud, you know, an engineered stud. Um, how does that material, if I took a piece of that engineered stud, which of your other products does that sort of equate to in terms of um, glues and, and resins and weatherproof. I mean, is it essentially the same thing as your premium subfloor panels? You know, could I soak it in a bucket of water or is it not that kind of an animal? It would be close in that. I mean, it's designed for a different application. So it's essentially the same as our, our LSL beam material. Okay. Okay. So it's that those two products are kind of made in, in tandem with each other. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, how is that made? I mean, do you guys know, okay, we're going to crank out a big bunch of two by fours here, or is it just a giant sheet that you're slicing up to make a little of this, a little of that? That's exactly what we're doing. Yeah. It starts off as a giant sheet. And then from that, we can of course optimize it, cut a variety of materials out of that, depending on what grade the, the finished or the, the billet is to start with. So how, th yeah, how thick is the, the billet? Well, we can go, you know, up to three and a half inches thick. Um, so you can, of course, cut that into studs if it's three and a half inches wide. Um, but then, of course, you can think of it laying on its side to create beam material. So is it the same? I mean, can you make or do you make studs out of both an inch and a half thick billet or a three and a half inch thick billet and you just change the way you cut it and it's the same thing? It's the same end result? Essentially, yes. Okay. Yep. Um very cool. I'm trying to think of which way the, the sort of the grain runs in those studs. So it's, yeah, it's going to run in the long direction. Right. So so similar to an OSB panel, you know, you typically put that 4 by 8 sheet perpendicular to your framing because it's stronger, mm -hmm. um, perpendicular to the joists. And so it's it's going to be a similar technology. Obviously, you want the along the length of the studs for it to be strong. Right. It does have a strength axis like like the she goods do. Yeah. Um, one thing I've heard from builders, this was early on, and I don't know if it's changed or or, or been been addressed, um, is that some people were complaining that it was harder to shoot nails into this. Not that it was harder, but that the nails were more likely to withdraw. Like if you were framing a wall on the flat and then you went to tip it up, that um, some guys were switching to screws to fasten the studs to the plates um, to reduce that withdrawal. Uh, is that... Uh, is that something you guys have heard or is that just a, kind of the one-off thing that I was learning about? Well, from, uh, you know, getting, you know, nailing the material, it is of course going to be, um, denser mm -hmm. than solid wood. 
So you're going to have to address that with more pressure on your nail guns and perhaps different nail guns. Uh, I haven't heard any issues around, you know, once you get a nail into LSL, it's really hard to get out. Okay. So I haven't had any issues of, of nails pulling out. Okay. Yeah, it should it should be really an ideal solution in that case, you know, with your tilted up walls that it's going to hold and be true. Okay. And um, is there anything that uh, – I've only worked with it again a little bit, and I'm not a framer, so I've worked on it on kind of special projects. But, you know, I imagine like anything else, there's there's a learning curve. There's characteristics of it. So I'm assuming you guys have picked up this product and you've cut it with a circular saw. You've talked to people who have worked with it. Is there any other differences that I need to that people would would catch on to? Like, am I more prone to getting a splinter? Is it uh, um, is it harder to make a pencil mark on it? Like, what are, what are sort of the the things that you have to adjust to? I guess I would answer that. And there's things that it there's issues that it helps resolve. Um, typically, if you're framing on a wall, um, you line out all your your studs and. Ideally, you'd want to sandwich them all together and, and kind of check to see if you have one that might be um, out of true or that might be twisted or, or bent in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. um, that's especially important in if you're framing up where you're going to, in your kitchen areas, um, anywhere you're going to have cabinets hung. Um, with the LSL products, um, that's not required, again, because everything is precise and everything's the same. Uh, so it actually, uh, from a framing perspective, simplifies the process of uh, assembly. And um, one of the things that's kind of cool, and we're seeing more and more people use the products this way, is the the huge variety of lengths that you can get. You know, where I've seen people now who they if they have a, you know a, a big house with one long gable wall, for instance, they'll do that entire bottom plate in one piece, or and then the studs going up the wall all the way up in one piece without having to to bridge or, or put in plates or anything like that. that I mean, that's super cool. Uh, what 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 sizes does it come in? I'm guessing it goes down to eight feet, but what does it go up to? Uh, well, technically, you could get up to sixty feet. Um, sixty, but, right? But now, whether or not you can incorporate that into your design and have it meet all the, the strength requirements, that would be the question. Um, but uh, but ultimately, that's what all of these products allow a designer to do. Um, if you look at our eye joists, they allow for uh, spans much longer than what you can achieve um, with solid wood. Um, our tall walls, you know, more and more homes are incorporating taller walls. And again, LSL studs allow you to um, create that tall wall without any, you know, visual defects in it um, yeah. once the home is built. How the hell do you get a 60-foot stud delivered? <laughs> It'll probably come delivered to the, uh, the retailer like that, and then they then cut it into the dimensions that the, oh. the user's going to need. So I don't get a 60-footer? If you want to buy one, you you know, to although buy I, you know, I have seen some, you know, some pretty uh, tall framing uh, being used. You know, I mean, I've seen it, uh, you know, for roof rafters using the LSL. I mean, I've seen, you know, that they're basically two stories tall, leaning up against a house uh, when they're framing up some of these uh, these stick built roofs. And uh, you know, I gotta imagine that I'd have to have that thing delivered by like a pair of Chinooks or something, like to get my lumber <laughs> dropped onto the site. Um, so what you guys don't have is, doesn't it max out at two by six for the for the LSL studs and framing lumber? Well, I guess it doesn't um, really it doesn't really max out. I mean, you could get yeah, more could than that, right? It. Yeah, our billet yeah. is much larger than that, obviously. So in theory, yes, you could get you know a variety of dimensions. Um, but it seems it seems like at that point people are so the common ones are two by four obviously but do people buy two by sixes also I'm guessing yeah, yes because insulation we yeah. stock, right we regularly stock two by six okay LSL. so and, and I'm guessing if you go bigger than that people are switching over to to an eye joist kind of a setup right uh, well you could do you know go to like a, an inch and three quarter wide piece of LSL you know and, and use you know something like that okay uh, for an application. Okay. I'm just curious, like, would anybody want to um, frame a roof with these? I mean, a flat roof is obviously desirable, but then I wondered, well, would you just switch over to, to eye joists at that point? Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, eye joists do make sense in that application, although, um, yeah, it really depends on what you're looking at. There are people who look at doing an LSL roof system also. Okay. 
Really? I've never seen that. That's cool. So so one of the key differences there is that if you're doing an eye joist roof system, you need to have a, a ridge beam. So that's a structural member running down the, the top of your roof line. Mm-hmm. Whereas with an LSL type system, you could utilize a ridge board, which is you know more similar to what people traditionally do with solid saw. Yeah. Okay. Um, so without being able to tell me about the products that you guys are coming out with, are there... Um, you know, what, what are the challenges that we're, that we're kind of as an industry facing? Is it, um, it, it seems like one of the reasons why all these stranded products have taken off is sure. I mean, you can make the argument about straighter walls or better spans, and that's certainly part of the argument, but isn't part of it just that, you know, we're a little short on trees these days and, you know, it's, it's going to be, you know, I've heard, I've heard very prominent building scientists make a prediction that, you know, you're going to see plywood go away completely and we're just going to switch over to to the stranded products just from a sheer, um, you know, production mentality. Um, and, yeah, I know you guys want that, but uh, do you think that's where we're going? We're just going to say yeah. we're going to so, eventually wave goodbye to plywood? So I think there's a couple of things there. One, I think you mentioned the, the tree supply. Mm-hmm. And so one of the nice things about that is – Right now, roughly 57% of the forests in the U.S. are privately owned. And so the nice thing is, is as the demand uh, for wood products increases, then there's this opportunity for more land to be used you know, for timber. If you were to go to Georgia, you know, 50 years ago, you saw a lot of cotton fields. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you drive through southern Georgia right now, what you see is a, is a lot of uh, loblolly pine forests. Okay. So, you know, so we get to... Get a little more oxygen pumped out into the world and uh you know and, and we'll continue to get the wood products going there and then with regard to the plywood versus osb i would just say that more and more people are realizing what a great option uh, oriented strand board is and that's really leveraging that more than anything so let me ask you this um you guys don't make any mdf right we don't know okay um and now is that just uh, again you're not set up for it kind of a, a situation well, MDF, if you think of the, the applications, is typically going more into um, furniture, um, you right. know, those types of products uh, where you're looking for a product that's very smooth and, and very um, consistent thickness. Everything that LP does is all um, structural building components. So there's so, so there's no none of your products get shuttled off to, let's say, like a cabinet plywood company that wants to veneer it. No, not typically. I mean, uh, there is a some OSB that does get used in, uh, say, furniture applications, mm-hmm. primarily upholstered furniture. So, you know, like a, a recliner or sofa or things like that that typically will get covered in foams and, and fabrics. Uh, the core of that will oftentimes be OSB. I've seen some people make uh, bar tops out of LSLs or LVLs or kitchen countertops. Very cool look. Right. Um, so I guess you don't necessarily have to go to a full – Full decorative. You can just go with the the natural beauty of the framing lumber. That's my that's my thing. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, and back on the the fiber resource, I think it's important to point out. I mean, there is a surplus of wood um, in the U.S. and so there's not a um, you know it is very much a sustainable resource. Um, everything that LP does um, uses a SFI sustainable forestry initiative um, in terms of procuring the fiber. Um, and that's the, the great thing about wood frame construction is you build a house out of this material and then 30 years later, the material that you use has regenerated itself in the forest right. as compared to steel and concrete, which once you use them, there's no re- regeneration of that material. Right. And, but, but it is true that you can use a, a smaller, younger tree for, for OSB than you could for plywood, right? That's true. Um, right. I would say roughly maybe 30% of our, our furnish going into OSB, like, um, in the southern forest come from, say, first thinnings. So that would be 15 years um, after the plantation trees where they go in and, and do that first cut. Yeah. They're only 15-year-old trees, and those trees come to our mills. Okay. Very cool. And how many mills do you guys have? I don't know. <laughs> I'll play, yeah, I'll we'll play the uh, – I started in August of 2017 card right here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what do we have? All in, probably uh, twenty six facilities. Jeez, that's so, it. <laughs> yeah, we've got, <laughs> and we've also uh, got a presence in South America as well. We've got uh, uh, one mill in Brazil. Uh, we've got two mills in Chile, and we're actually in the process of building a third. Well, now you're just bragging. <laughs> 
Absolutely. Right. Well, I mean, I appreciate you guys swinging, swinging by via Skype to talk about all this stuff. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure that we may end up with uh, a lot of our listeners getting back to us with questions or feedback on things that we talked about here. So I hope it's all right if maybe uh, we circle back and, you know, throw some follow-up questions to you guys. Maybe we can get an answer via email if there's anything that we want to want to share going going after this episode. Is that cool? It would be our pleasure. Great. Well, thanks very much, guys, for hopping on. And uh, anybody who's looking to find out more about LP, um, obviously you can go to your lumber yard or home center, but what's the website? LPCorp.com. Beautiful. All right, guys, you have yourself a nice weekend, will you? Dude, Thank you, you, too. Great talking to you. Bye. Bye. And to everybody else, I'd like to thank you for listening to yet another episode of Fine Home Building. We will be back next week with another regularly scheduled episode full of questions and problems to solve. So until next time, this is Justin Fink for Justin Fink and Jeff Rose saying uh, keep craft alive and happy building. <laughs>